Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. It's a pleasure being here with all of you. Uh, My name is Dr. Sudha Balajapali, and I'll be moderating for this panel. So uh, the format is is that we will start promptly. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Promptly is relative. (laughs) We'll we'll start promptly. I will introduce the speakers, then they will do a presentation. All of them will do the presentation, then we'll have a discussion. It's supposed to go until 10, uh, 11.30, all right? Okay, very good. Um, all right, our first speaker today is Natalie Furtz, um, and she is from the Henry L. Smithson Center uh, Research Associate. Uh, discussing project C-O-R-V-I, uh, Climate Change Ocean Risk Vulnerability Initiative, and its ability to enhance coastal communities, uh, communities' ability to uh, adapt to climate change. So um, without further ado. My name is Natalie Fiertz. Uh, I'm from the Stimson Center. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we're a research institution uh, based up in DuPont Circle. Uh, I know my slide says 30 years, but this is actually our 35th year anniversary since our founding. Um, We were founded 35 years ago to address a number of security uh, challenges in sort of new and innovative perspectives. So I'm a member of the environmental security team. um, And today I'll be talking about CORV, the Climate and Ocean Risk Vulnerability Initiative. Uh, Obviously, on this type of panel, I don't need to talk about why uh, climate adaptation is such an urgent issue. Uh, We could list off events that make that clear. Just to pull a couple from the last week alone, uh, we've had 15,000 people displaced by flooding in Kenya. We've had another record month of ocean temperatures. And we've had projections that this year will be the most active hurricane season since 2017, um, when we had intense and very damaging hurricanes like Irma uh, and Maria. Now, the Corvi tool fills a number of gaps in climate adaptation work. Um, And there's really sort of three key niches that it aims to fill, um, or three key principles on which it is founded. So the first is that climate impacts are integrated. And what I mean by that is one cannot look at just, say, sea level rise um, in its own little box without considering how it also interacts with economic, social, and political systems. So as you can see uh, by this infographic, Corvi covers the whole range of ecological, financial, political, and social dimensions of climate and ocean risk. It considers things like how solid waste impacts flooding in a city, which impacts uh, public health and disease, how marine heat waves affect coral reefs, which then affects tourism tourism based economies and uh, employment and uh, economic patterns or how inland patterns such as heat and drought can impact migration into coastal cities, which then impacts housing, often cutting down mangrove forests, and thereby also increasing uh, the risk of the city to storm surge. So Corvi is, uh, as its name, the Climate and Ocean Risk Vulnerability (laughs) Initiative. It looks at island states and coastal cities, but it really takes a full land to sea perspective to produce a very comprehensive and integrated assessment of the vulnerability and risk that the community that we're assessing faces. The second principle that Corvi is based on is that climate impacts are local. So there's a lot of information, often climate risk is discussed at the national level or even the regional level. So as I, you know, the events that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the hurricane season in the Caribbean or flooding in Kenya, Um, These are often discussed at a fairly high level. What we know is that the actual impacts of climate change occur on the local level, and adaptation measures must be taken also at the local level. When you build a seawall, when you replant a mangrove forest, you don't do that at the national level. You do that in a specific location. So while it's important to know that, say, the country of St. Kitts and Nevis, where we finished a project last year, is facing sea level rise risk, it's even more useful to know to adaptation planners and policymakers and financers that there is particularly high risk of sea level rise and flooding 
in the neighborhoods of Half Moon Pond and Connery in the capital city of Basseterre. Similarly, when one is planning adaptation uh, efforts in Dagupan in the Philippines, another area in which we finished an assessment last year, it's helpful to know that the uh, local economy of that city is heavily dependent on tourism for the Bagus Fish Festival, which is a very local uh, type of fish in which uh, is fished around the city of Dagupan, and there's this enormous festival in which people come from all over the country. It's a major contributor to the city's economy um, and employment, uh, but it is, it is a very local factor that one would not be able to recognize if one were looking at climate impacts from a national level. Finally, the third principle on which Corvi is founded is filling data gaps, particularly in local vulnerability data. So there, as I sort of referenced earlier, there is increasingly good data on hazard and exposure, two of the dimensions to risk, and there's pretty good data, or getting increasingly good data at national and regional levels. But what we found when we started Corvi six years ago now uh, was that local level data on the vulnerability aspects of risk was a major gap in adaptation planning and implementation. And so that is the third sort of niche that Corvi aims to fill. So as I said, Corvi has sort of three principles in which it is different. It is local, providing subnational level detail on the nature and impact of climate and ocean risks. It's holistic, looking across a broad set of ecological, financial, social, and political risk factors, and how those risk factors compound, cascade, and interact. And finally, it's data-driven. It uses a methodology known as structured expert judgment to fill data gaps that exist and inform actionable insights in data-sparse environments. Another way of saying this is that while in many cases, assessments of climate and ocean risk start with what data is available and then see what types of questions can be answered using that data, with Corvi, we start with what questions are important to answer and then how can we find or create the data that we need to answer them. So with that, what actually is Corvi? So it's a decision support tool using the framework that you see in this, we call it the Corvi <coughs> wheel on the right here. So it has three dimensions of risk, financial, ecological, and sociopolitical. Within those three dimensions, there are 10 categories of risk, which perhaps you can read. It's a pretty big picture. Hopefully you can. Uh, on the sort of inside wheel there. And then within those 10 categories, there are approximately 100 different risk indicators. So Corvi produces uh, risk scores for each of those 100 risk indicators and the 10 categories to allow policymakers, decision makers, local leaders, and importantly, funders to identify what are the priority risks in a given community. And it also, in addition to the quantifi quanti quantifiable scores, it also includes a narrative analysis to contextualize those scores and also includes priority recommendations to build resilience in response to those highlighted risks. We've have done or are doing Corvi assessments in 16 cities across the global south, from the Caribbean to the South Pacific. We started in uh, 2018. You can see from the bottom here that we've had a number of, uh, quite a wide range of funders and partners who have uh, assisted with our work. Um, if you count very quickly, there's only 13 cities on the map there. That's because it, not, it doesn't include the three most recent assessments um, in Mauritius, Dominica, and Aruba. But you can see that we really span uh, the whole range of the tropical areas of the globe and the global south. Finally, to get a sense of uh, what the outcomes or the outputs of Corvi are. So as I said, it produces risk scores, relative risk scores for each one of the 100 risk indicators and the 10 categories. This is an example for an assessment we did in Basseterre in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, a couple of two years ago actually now, uh, just showing the sort of types of data that are an output of Corvi. It highlights the, the risk of that city uh, from, its from its dependence on climate vulnerable um, economic sectors such as coastal and marine tourism, as well as the risks inherent in its reliance on a vulnerable power grid that relies on imported fossil fuels, especially diesel. 
we publish all these scores um, in a publicly accessible data portal. So if you go on our website, you can play around with all of the risk scores from all of the assessments that we've finished. It allows you to visualize these scores in a number of different ways, comparing them between cities, drilling down into individual categories and indicators. And also on our website um, are the full reports that include the narrative analysis and the recommendations for each city. Now, we're always trying to work on what are the next steps that we need to improve Corvi and make it more useful to the policymakers and leaders in which we are working with on the ground. So, recently we've added um, additional indicators that are relevant to the uh, intersection of public health and climate change in response to uh, the needs identified by our partners in a couple of assessments. Going forward, we are looking at developing sector-specific assessments in which we dive deeper into the specific risks and opportunities of a given sector. So this may be fisheries or green shipping, ports, tourism, that kind of thing. Rather than looking at an entire community as a whole, we want to look at what are the specific risks that uh, a, a sector or an industry is facing and what specific actions should they be taking to increase their resilience and to foster climate resilient growth. And the other thing is we are developing a post-assessment financing module. So one of the gaps that has become clear from the assessments that we have done is that even once a community has all the information provided by Corvi, there is still a gap between that information and the information that funders, whether those are in multilateral development banks or the private sector or bilateral governments, the information that those funders need in order to actually fund and implement adaptation solutions and so we're working on a post-assessment module to bridge that gap. And that is it. Thank you. Uh, Our next speaker will be Francisco Aquino, uh, sorry, Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico uh, Science, Technology, and uh, Research Trust, PRSTRT, and Caribbean Center for Raising Seas, CCRS, Legislation and Policy Manager, discussing how Puerto Rico adapt adapt adaptability uh, initiatives can be applicable elsewhere. Thank you. Okay, so yes, uh, my name is Francisco Aquino. Uh, I'm an attorney. Um, I'm also the public policy and legislation manager for the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust, uh, specifically the Caribbean Center for Rising Seas. Uh, the Caribbean Center for Rising Seas, uh, other than being um, uh, an initiative, a program of the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust, it's also part of the, we're an affiliate of the um, Rising Seas in Institute, which is a larger uh, global organization that deals with uh, the problem of rising seas um, throughout the world. So, the, you know, what's the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust? Let's start there. Um, uh, the trust, what it does, it's a private nonprofit that administers a trust. The trust was created by law in Puerto Rico in 2004. Um, this structure, what it does, it, it, it helps provide stability to the development of science and research in Puerto Rico, um, instead of depending on, you know, the changing administrations and governmental administrations in Puerto Rico, um, the the money was allocated to this trust, and it's managed by the by the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust. It has four pillars. Uh, it has a research and development pillar. It has a entrepreneurship. Uh, pillar uh, where you can see the different projects that we have. The, under each pillar you can see the uh, programs, the specific programs that belong to the category. Uh, we have a public health pillar and an education programs. The CCRS, the Caribbean Center for Icing Seas, is under the research and development pillar. So uh, this busy slide, I'm sure you it's not going to be that easy to read, but basically what it shows is that our, we have a trajectory that starts in 2004. Uh, most of our programs were created be, uh, before 2019, uh, but the Korean Center for Icing Seas itself was created in 2021 after the experience that Puerto Rico had with Hurricane Maria. 
So it has been a very successful model. Um, as you can see here in the research and development pillar, we've, we managed during, during the 2022-2023 uh, fiscal year, new, 20 new patent applications. We were uh, already administering 84 patents. The, in, the, in the entrepreneurship pillar, we invested over $1 million in new companies. 40% of the companies that we've helped uh, were you know, led by, by women. Uh, the number has been growing. The, in the public health sector, we have uh, 35 active clinical studies. And in the education center, uh, basically, we, we're, we're growing. We're still growing. The, we, we administer 69 acres of land, uh, which is to develop the, what we call Science City. Uh, we inaugurated a building uh, like two weeks ago. We call it the Forward Center. And that new building is going to host uh, other programs too from the, from the trust. So we have a lot of space to develop uh, and we're you know, st still seeing a lot of progress in the, in the Puerto Rico Science Trust. So uh, the rising seas problem in Puerto Rico is, is crucial for us. We have 44 coastal municipalities. And uh, that includes you know, the, the, the lands that are affected by rising seas or are going to be affected by rising seas includes a lot of um, prime agricultural uh, terrain and uh, thousands and thousands of buildings, uh, some of them critical infrastructure. Also, uh, there's a great part of the population, as you can see here, uh, at least uh, or near to a million people in Puerto Rico are and high risk of the rising seas problem. Also, uh, these risks include coastal erosion and other types of flooding. So we're talking about if Puerto Rico has right now around uh, 3.2 million inhabitants. Uh, we used to have four, uh, but after Hurricane Maria, a lot of people left the island uh, because the destruction was, uh, was big. And it's been declining, so with our 3.2 people, we're talking uh, close to you know, one third of the population uh, could be impacted by rising seas problem in the island. And this is a part of a larger regional context, right? The Caribbean is often affected by larger and bigger hurricanes each year. Uh, persistent drought, Puerto Rico is also uh, going to be access affected by drought. We're gonna be living between extremes. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the type of things that we're, that we're dealing about. That's why the Caribbean Center for Icing Seas is not only focusing on Puerto Rico, but in the Caribbean as a, as a whole. So, uh, faced with this problem the, and the CCRS, we, we try to help, or we're helping Puerto Rico prepare um, to adapt and thrive in the face of the rising seas problem. Um, we do this by facilitating um, capacity building, by investing also in projects that work on adapting Puerto Rico to rising seas and researching about the rising seas problem in the island. My, my part in particular being the, you know, the policy and legislation manager uh, is working with updating uh, regulations and uh, you know, building a better regulatory fr framework to deal with the rising seas issue in Puerto Rico. Uh, we are contributing also by researching and developing uh, the support, uh, these support tools. I'm going to show you a couple of them right now. Um, these support tools actually help us, you know, um, think critically about the presuppositions that have governed planning um, for the past decades. One of these tools is our Rising Seas um, dashboard. You can see here that it shows the estimated land loss in Puerto Rico and the number of structures that are gonna be at risk. It's moving, right? Yep. Uh, so uh, this dashboard, you're gonna see right in a second, uh, you can see the areas that are, we modeled, the areas that are supposed to start flooding, uh, depends right on the year that you're looking at. It counts how many uh, infrastructures or how many structures are gonna be affected. And this really helps us understand the rising seas problem and also helps uh, communities and government um, you know, understand what we're facing and how we should move and how we should address the problems that, we, that we're looking at. Also, let me see if it moves, there you go. We, we work with Arcly to develop this tool that can help us communicate um, flooding risks better. It integrates different data sets 
into one map. And the, you, you're going to see the blue area is the FEMA uh, flooding zones. The red colors are the, the risks uh, from rising seas in particular. And this map really helps us communicate the flood risks in terms of money for individual property in Puerto Rico. Um, also, we, we try to innovate in terms of education and advocacy. We, we promote impactful policies that help us integrate communities in the planning process, not only in the execution process of um, adaptation measures. Uh, here we have, uh, there's a project that we did in a community that Margarita has flooded numerous times. Uh, people have, have had to re reconstruct their homes, I think over six times in the past 30 years. And uh, here we, we made accessible uh, NASA information. We, worked, we collaborated with NASA so that these communities, the people that live in the communities, can actually use these tools, the tools that NASA provides, to look at the problems that they're, that they're seeing from, you know, um, in, in sat from the satellites, uh, identify the causes, and, you know, um, look for solutions, right? Uh, work with the solutions, too, not only in the, in the implementation pro uh, phase of the projects. We are also, um, we have a couple of projects. Uh, these are just, I think, the, the top ones that, are, uh, that come to mind. Uh, but we have many other uh, things in our pipeline. Um, the one that I'm working on uh, personally is to fund uh, community geolabs so that communities can have more access to information. They can bring us uh, some of the problems that they're, that they're seeing and they can actually model solutions and see that the impact, the impact that those solutions have in, in, a virtual, uh, in a virtual scenario. Not, you know, they don't have to implement it and see how, um, how they're going to work in, in practically. Right? So this, this really helps communities make proposals to government instead of being just uh, passive entities. Um, we're working also on, on having a research observatory to accumulate uh, data and research in Puerto Rico about rising seas. Uh, uh, we're, we, we hope to soon work on AI-assisted technologies. Uh, this can look in many ways. We can talk about it later uh, if, you know, if, we, if you, want, you want to talk about that. And uh, we're, we're actually uh, collaborating with DMU. Hopefully, we're going to start a project soon to improve access to resiliency hubs and uh, communication networks in Puerto Rico because after Maria, after Hurricane Maria hit, a lot of people were left stranded in the communities. They were, um, they, they, it was hard for them to get water and food, uh, many communities, especially in the mountains. So working with, uh, you know, that not happening, right, having access to resilient subs and uh, having stronger networks is going to be very, very important. So uh, that's what we do. Uh, thank you for the time. And uh, if you have any questions or want to talk about a specific project, you know, uh, I'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Iliad Terra, CEO, CEO and Design Principal, Alpha 8 enabling ability in sustainable and resilient cities through innovation and dynamic design. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so um, I want to uh, kind of take a different track here and really talk about the role of the design community, the designer, the architect, um, in vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Um, Alpha 8 is an architecture, urban planning, and technology integration uh, firm. With um, uh, award-winning projects, we uh, designed the first smart city in the Washington DC area, Gramercy District, uh, which is still in progress, recognized by President Obama in 2016 as the top innovation in the region. Uh, we're working with projects uh, in, in uh, clean ports in Europe with different uh, partners. Uh, in Middle East, in uh, Central Africa, and throughout the U.S. Um, and uh, we've got global technology partners um, that are profoundly innovative and the cutting edge of solutions, and we'll share a little bit about that. Um, but the, the focus of this presentation is really the role of the designer in navigating the topography of change, um, climate change, 
and the various aspects of that. So I'm kind of delighted to hear about Corvi. Corvi uh, is, is the type of companies that organizations that we would like to collaborate with. And also I'll, I'll pick on what Sherry mentioned earlier in f uh, threat multipliers. So one of the things that um, we look at is really from a design perspective, what we call multi-vector challenges threatening our world in, 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 in the aspect of climate change, but all the, the compound threats that are facing us and the design community's responsibility to address that. And some of these are visible and understandable right away, but some of these threats are very uh, 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 invisible, gradual, uh, subtle, and, but yet they're profoundly impactful. Uh, we all are familiar with the rise of homelessness, not only throughout the major cities, but you know, uh, rural communities. This is increasing, and there's a structural issue with valuation of real estate in this country and affordability. This is increasing, and the, the new generation uh, and uh, across the, the, the board are not able to afford, maintain, uh, residences, and this, this is, this is a, a tsunami that is hitting us. Um, the other uh, issue that's really uh, an aspect of climate change that we don't talk about, we don't understand uh, fully, is really the rise of mental uh, health issues. Uh, and this is, again, the double edge of technology and social media uh, progress, the cost of progress, and how it's impacting individuals uh, and this, these individuals then impact communities and cities and nations. This is something that is growing and there's not enough public dialogue about this. So as designers, we need to address this. And when I say the designers, it's not simply the architects, it's the policy makers, the stakeholders, the design thinkers, the strategists, across the holistic spectrum, there's an ethical responsibility. Um, you know, Lynn and I talk about this, the Appalachia the rural communities, they're dying. We're not talking about this on the national platform sufficiently. Uh, we've witnessed, you know, Wheeling, Frostburg, Cumberland, one after the other. This is, this is America, and it's nice to talk about, you know, all the technologies, everything else, but where's the application here? Where's the impact here? Why are we not discussing that? Um, something that's really, really compelling is the destructive allure of AI and how we are rushing headlong towards this panacea, but it's not. It has a lot of threats and, and, and we're hearing the alarms across the board. Yet corporations, enterprise, solutions are running, rushing in a competitive frenzy. Uh, it is going to disrupt us and it is going back to issues of mental health and and job creation, all of this, we're not addressing that. Yet AI offers uh, advantages as well. And of course, the impact of progress on our environment. This is, now these five images were all generated by AI through Midjourney as part of this presentation. So we are actually engaging through OpenAI and Midjourney to question what is the impact. And these are the images that's coming in. So this is, a, this is, as we speak, we're looking at AI very, very directly into it. These are impacts that I just mentioned, but as Sherry mentioned earlier, the multi-vector threat multiplier uh, is that ending. We can just use our imagination, wars and instabilities, et cetera, migrations, population shifts. So here's what I think is critical. This is a question, what ails you, my king? If you're familiar with it, this is the, the, the curse and, and the quest of Parsifal. So as the designers, as the stakeholders, as policy makers, it is incumbent on us to ask the question and then step into that, not simply give it a theoretical gloss or, or a, you know, a, a fast glance or you know, a, a policy or, but really act you know, from a place of compassion and then action. So um, when I said design, to us, to Alpha 8, the word design itself is very, very um, sacred, if you will, sacrosanct. In 
So off the sign, the signature of source. So in here, we feel that the responsibility for us as architects and urban planners, as decision makers, is to really ask those questions. What ails our nation? What ails our planet? And not shirk, not avert our eyes. Look deeply into that. And then listen deeply to those, 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 those answers. And then move into the right solutions. This is required now more than ever. And it's been the, the, the quest of humanity. Um, so um, coming more specifically, the role of construction in emission is a whopping 42% of global CO2 emission. This is construction, so the built environment is a massive, massive component of, of what is impacting our planet and our lives. This is just a construction phase. When we go into operation, uh, O&M, into usage, that's, that's a multiplier right there that, that is impactful. So um, architecture 2030 is a goal uh, that, uh, uh, you know, as, as we, uh, heard earlier, uh, not only, and, uh, and, and you know, um, a colleague of mine is here, uh, Daruk, and I, well, I'll touch on that, uh, not reach uh, net zero, but uh, net positive uh, solution. That's a goal that is established by, by and it's adopted by the uh, AIA. Um, however, uh, the, the uh, Unfortunate reality is that the vast majority of the design profession is not uh, uh, reaching or living up to that standard. So this is a problem, and we'll touch on that. But what are these goals? So passive design uh, and, and, and energy efficiency, adaptive reuse and retrofitting, which is a project I'll touch on, water management. Uh, look at that, US average is 100 gallons per day. That's, that's uh, per person, that's massage massive uh, usage of, of, of uh, and when you compare that to the global, it's, it's uh, so we are, we are guilty here. Green infrastructure and biodiversity, material and life cycle analysis, bio, biophilic design, resilient and adaptive design, uh, offsite construction, hugely important. Digital tools, BIMs, and we'll touch on that, uh, project we're doing, restorative architecture, reversible design, and then of course the education component, which which comes in the very beginning and at the end of, of this, this list. So here's, here's an example, the vertical forest in Milan by Stefani Bori. This is, is a phenomenal project. It's, it's created its own microclimate and it is done, it is achievable. Why don't we have more of this? Um, this, uh, the edge in Amsterdam by PLP is an example of an adaptive uh, building that can be retrofitted dynamically, open floor uh, uh, plans, uh, flexible workspaces, sensors, uh, IOT, that, that it's a smart building that moves dynamically with the user, with the intent. It's done, it's here, why are we not doing more of this? Uh, this is a phenomenal project in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, um, you know, we've been, as Sam knows, and, and others involved in waste to energy projects in, in, um, in Central Africa uh, and, uh, and elsewhere. But this is a phenomenal example of uh, having a waste to energy plant, but it is also a ski resort. It's also climbing walls. It's also a park. So it is a, a plant that is integrated in the community. Uh, why are we not doing more of this? Um, Shanghai Tower by Gensler. Phenomenal tower that is generating with its turbine uh, energy. It has a double insulated um, layer of skin that traps and, and uh, insulates the building in a phenomenal way, but also it generates a significant portion of its own energy. Uh, again, this is a technology that's available to us. Why are we not doing this? A uh, simple project on the, on the residential front by Roger Ferris and Partners in Connecticut this building is, is buried into the earth, uh, and it's got south-facing glazing uh, that is leveraging passive energy uh, components and aspects. Uh, this can be easily achieved throughout our vernacular, residential vernacular through the country. But we've got lobbyists that are challenging this, fighting this. So again, why are we not moving in that space? Uh, 
Ocean X City by Big, a uh, visionary project that looks into uh, challenges of sea level rising in some of the, in Puerto Rico, for example, um, and, and creating a flotilla of uh, a city, micro city, that, that, uh, that populates, houses 20,000 people. This is actually in progress, and it is designed for the Maldives, but right now in, in Northern Europe, this is actually being developed. So these are just few examples. Um, this is a project we are involved in, we're doing in, in New York, uh, with City University of New York, Dragonfly, which is leveraging technology in student housing, in teleeducation, integrated as part of the DNA of, of, of the building. So it is, is bringing uh, capabilities for multiple universities and, and pedagogical and experiential level into the, the, the infrastructure itself, decentralizing the university, as an example. So we are in conversation with, with uh, CUNY on this. Uh, this one is really, really a project that is um, dear to me. I'm a US Army veteran, um, and, uh, and we're very excited about this project. Veteran housing, we have uh, secured a very prominent investor. Uh, so what this is, essentially, is retrofitting uh, a commercial office building and turning it into uh, two uh, components. One, uh, housing for homeless veterans in partnership with the Department of Veteran Affairs. And secondarily, vertical farming. So not only it is productive in, in, uh, uh, in uh, energy and productive in food products, but it also becomes um, an opportunity for the veterans to be involved in there. So we're creating an innovative solution to um, uh, upside down, vacant um, uh, commercial office space that is becoming really a problem uh, with a lot of holders and, and developers. So this project is, is in progress right now and, and uh, um, we're, we're looking forward to getting this uh, off the ground. Um, but Crescent Heights is, is a large developer out of um, uh, Florida, that's our partner in this project. Um, but this is something that we're working, which goes back into Core V, which goes back into um, a lot of different um, components. And this is really the complexity problem that we are facing with technology right now. Uh, in our profession, in my profession, uh, not only do we have various tools that we use, Tremble, Revit, Autodesk, etc., but we also have indi indi uh, indices and we also have regulatory bodies that are all coming in into their own what we call garden wall solutions. So this complexity comes in and within this complexity, uh, the stakeholder, the decision maker is now uh, inundated, unable to make clear decisions and a lot of this is what we call lost in translation. So this is a question of value. So all of these pillars and, and uh, specialized areas are not interoperable in many cases, and the void between them is a significant loss of value that is left on the table because different components and stakeholders are not collaborating effectively, different technologies are not. So one of the things where we're, de we're de in, in the process of developing is what we call XI, which is really integrating uh, in a, in a um, uh, markup language in, in an AI uh, substrate the different components to come in so that they can speak together. In, in the next iteration, or we, we call next, next generation BIM, build, Building Information Modeling, that uh, uh, allows us to, from inception, from the decision-making aspect uh, of, of a project, an urban planning, or, or city, or campus, or whatever it may be, from the very beginning, using data-driven capabilities, using parametrics, uh, using AI, availing the stakeholders of infinite possibilities, calculating that and bringing that into a decision. So now you're moving from, from inception to concept to design development to execution to then continuing the entire life cycle of that process. This is something that we're, that's on our tables right now that we're working with. Um, so um, with that, what I will close is that we, we can uh, we're here, we have a, a booth, 
and we'll be at the Pentagon, and so we can answer questions. But uh, we also have uh, very, very key strategic partners. Uh, one of them is uh, a company, Moby, uh, that is currently working very closely with IDF live right now in theater. Uh, it is a mobility platform with phenomenal sophistication that's partnered with Alpha 8 um, that we are uh, interested in deploying in the U.S., in the municipalities, et cetera, but uh, uh, going beyond that. Uh, the other one is really uh, a, a profoundly sustainable manufacturing partner that we are bringing on board, uh, Colección, uh, who is also here, which uh, uh, focuses on, on um, wearable solutions and urban uh, uh, energy solutions in extreme weather solutions in, and, uh, um, but with a sustainable net positive manufacturing capability out of Turkey. So our international footprint um, uh, affords us in, in really this kind of diverse capability. So with that, um, we're open to questions. Please visit us and um, thank you. Thank you again. So uh, we have 15 minutes for discussion and questions. Questions for the panelists. Thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, two quick, hopefully quick questions for the Center for Rising Seas. Uh, Excellent to see the data is available for communities. The big question is, can you give us examples of prioritizing the implementation actions for a community, given that money is, uh, is limited? Uh, that's the first question. And then for Alpha 8, uh, the edge was a very interesting uh, example that you brought up. My question is, does Alpha 8 have off-the-shelf ready best practices for local designers, architects, development teams to use to create buildings that are easily adaptable from build it now as multifamily, transition it down the road to commercial office or to hotels with minimal c and waste, cost, and effort. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, prioritizing activities uh, to adapt to rising seas is obviously super important, right? Uh, like, like you mentioned, um, Puerto Rico has uh, limited, uh, you know, sources of funding. However, the way we prioritize projects um, is with the communities, right? So we, one of the reasons that we are making such a big emphasis in going to the communities and or helping communities organize around the issue of the rising seas is precisely to, you know, have this discussion about what's important to the community and what's important to adapt to rising seas. So it will depend a lot on the profile of the community itself and the priorities that the community already has. Uh, but uh, having said that, there are a couple of communities with uh, clear adaptation priorities already. Uh, for example, the, um, we in La, La Margarita on the south of uh, one of the, well, the pictures that I showed you here, um, that community, one of the things that we're uh, trying to work with that community is actually raising the homes. So it would be a project to, um, there, and then there, we have, I mean, there is a technology already. Um, it's just working with, with the partners to uh, find the funding to start raising those homes and putting them on pillars so that when flooding comes again to that area, um, the homes will get destroyed, right? So, and, and this is, we're talking about low income community. Uh, if, you, if you look at the west side of the <coughs> island, the priorities there are working more with like, um, nature-based solutions because the, those areas are more prone to coastal erosion and that's the best fit to, that, to those communities on, on, the, on the west side of the island. Now on the northern side of the island, we have communities like Aloisa, which is like uh, it's very low um, compared to, the, to the, the level of the ocean. And unfortunately, communities like those are gonna be hugely affected by rising seas uh, by 2050. So with communities like that, we're trying to develop the ideal framework so that 
when they eventually have to be relocated because of permanent flooding, uh, that is done in a way that really uh, res respects the like the 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 network of the community, the the shared cultural background that respects their you know the fact that their their their, their livelihoods, right? That respects like really the cohesion of the community itself, and it's done in a very humane and respectful way. So we don't have that. A legal framework yet in Puerto Rico, but uh, that would be the priority for communities that must be relocated. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. And uh, to, uh, in a simple answer, yes. We have off-the-shelf capability um, in, in terms of property or prop tech uh, um, technology that uh, can facilitate, enhance, and augment um, decision making for developers, for designers, for architects in that process, um, ready made. One of the uh, areas that we are focused in is strategic design consultancy. So we uh, are tapped into the best practices in the design industry. We are constantly on the research, examining, in dialogue and conversation with what is the leading edge. So Alpha 8 serves that role to um, inform, partner, strategically advise, uh, educate, impact policy in terms of design, uh, and bring those capabilities like edge. Uh, a lot of these innovations exist. These are not new. They, they, are, they have existed for decades. In many instances in the US, we are behind uh, the schedule so we can bring those innovations readily and we are doing that we are actively in that conversation so we'd be happy to uh, have those conversations with with you and and others in that regard go ahead hi <clears throat> my name is Frederick Ruiz Ramon I run a small company that works mostly in Africa but also in Latin America developing vehicles for niche markets um, and we're going to be building our facilities most likely out of compressed earth block um, in order to have a lower cost up front, but also just the efficiencies that that allows. And I was wondering, based on the presentation of Alpha 8, um, first, it was a technical question on the 42%. Did that include the emissions and everything else that goes into, say, making the cement and all these other things that go into the buildings, or is it just the construction part? That's just a, a little question. And then my other, the other part of my question was, um, it, and you hinted at it, it, it has to do with uh, building regulations, which are often at local levels, that make it very difficult to do some of the things you're doing, or to, for example, even do that simple house that you mentioned there that was sort of underground, or things like compressed earth blocks. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about that in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, especially in developing countries where many times they seem to have gotten stuck using a lot of cement, for example, when they have alternatives, whether it's the ones you're mentioning or others. So uh, <clears throat> the, the answer to the, the first question, uh, the 42 percent contains, con uh, uh, includes the embodied um, energy. Um, so uh, we look at it that, the, you know, when we look at the life cycle, it's even greater than that. But, uh, you know, production of lithium, for example, the, the, the embodied footprint on that um, is, is enormous. So we take a step back and we look at, you know. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, really the regulatory components and aspects, it, it's an uphill battle in the U.S. We've got, on the one hand, the lobbyists that are, are very active, and then uh, the, the uh, different indices and uh, policy uh, modification, it is a very labor-intensive process. Um, so the bureaucracy is, so it goes through those, and it has to be challenged, and it has to be part of that. So one of the areas that we are looking into is really data. The power of data to really demonstrate and power of parametrics to start creating those, those numbers and cents and dollars and cents that then speak to the decision makers and the policy makers. Um, it's a little bit easier internationally. Uh, some of those uh, regulations are less stringent 
uh, in Europe, for example, or in Africa. Or in, uh, but then the challenge is availability of resources there, labor capabilities and, and skill sets, uh, and, uh, and the resources and transportation, logistics. So it's always this kind of dilemma where we have resources here, we are very, very uh, 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 rigid in, in modifying. And, and as I alluded earlier, the, even in the design process, we have this ideal um, benchmark for 2030. However, um, most of the profession is not adopting it. They're, they're falling back into what they know in their comfort zone and complacency. So it's, it's a, a challenge we've taken on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we welcome your innovations, obviously, moving that. And I think it's, it's, it's a question of leadership. We step into that, we step into the plate, and we swing. Uh, that's what we've got to do. And, and, it's, and, and I go back to the ethical responsibility. We cannot close our eyes. We cannot avert. So policy, regulation, uh, codes, zoning, uh, all of this requires really an active dialogue. So we're involved with the AIA in that part. I'm a member of ULI, Urban Land Institute. We work with various um, uh, uh, you know, regulatory bodies and, and platforms and technologies like sidewalk labs, et cetera, to, to be able to uh, push those, those uh, policies and regulations. But it's happening. We just stay in it, and, and more of us will need to do that. Go ahead. Uh, Charles Botwick here. So <clears throat> I have a, I'll, I'll say in a word what the question is about. The Lafushi, if I'm pronouncing it right, is a trash island in the Maldives that they, they built especially uh, for containing trash from all the beautiful places that people like to stay. So in the spirit of everything is every connected in, in the different uh, tourism, uh, the, the theme of uh, Earth Day this year is planet versus plastics, okay? And we're talking about thoughtful design, maybe AI design, and how everything is connected in these crazy diagrams of, of having to design buildings, which maybe have new materials, less waste. So part of it is asking each of you uh, to comment about from the design standpoint, from the tourism standpoint, and from the waste management standpoint, how does this all work in with your models? Uh, because ultimately, we have to look at, no matter what we do, uh, it's not just uh, a technological. Uh, we, we have to look at how we integrate all that. So just since you talked about the Maldives, and maybe new construction there, and how important tourism and rising seas and all the potential contamination issues at the same time. How do we do all that? Big question. So interesting question. And, and so I touched on uh, Oceanic City, um, which is ultimately designed, focused on the Maldives. Um, really, uh, there's advances in nanotechnology, in construction materials, in, in uh, recycling plastics and in, in integrating it in, into new building materials. So this is something that uh, is an exciting area that uh, uh, from a design perspective, we look at these new materials and, and methods and, and uh, materials and construction, but also in terms of the energy, the, the organic energy, the organic waste, uh, developing modular, we are in conversations with our partners in Italy, in, in, in Turkey, in having modular uh, waste to energy uh, converters that then can and address some of that organic waste that, that's being collected in that site. But really in master planning and designing, capturing uh, solar, wind, and, and uh, wave water energy in, in, in terms of these, these uh, locations. This is phenomenal opportunities that technology, the positive side of technology affords us. So uh, what I would say is, let's put together the, the, the think tank, the, the uh, committee, and we start looking at that. And, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, the, the available to all of us. Nobody wants to go to a touristic area where it smells and it's covered with trash. Right. And it comes down to the value. So how do you bring tourism into that? Right. Even Bodrum, Turkey, they have that issue. Yeah. So, um, Coincidentally, before 
um, assuming this role as policy and legislation manager for the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust. Uh, I used to work in uh, waste management policy. Uh, I helped uh, develop a, a plan for Puerto Rico, uh, which is in, it's called the Generación Circular, which is you know how do, how do we implement in Puerto Rico different strategies uh, to create a circular economy, right? But I think on the, on the topic of plastics, um, I don't think there's any like final solution except banning plastics. I mean, especially single-use plastics. Single-use plastics in Puerto Rico are a huge problem. Um, recently, actually, uh, the legislature in Puerto Rico uh, banned single-use plastics, but there's pushback now that's supposed to come into effect in June. So a lot of companies are uh, pushing back. Um, so, you know, plastics, especially single-use ones, especially the ones that we that carry food or that we put into our mouths, uh, also have uh, health effects. And uh, we've seen a lot of that in Puerto Rico. Um, and banning plastics, is, again, especially single-use ones, I think it really opens up the opportunity to innovate with new materials and to uh, develop better alternatives that don't cause the same health impacts and the same uh, problems with waste management. Uh, a lot of people do eat things or use bags and then throw them on the beach. And like legislators have, you know, pass laws to uh, fine people for throwing trash, but in terms of policy, that's that's hard to imp that's, that's hard to execute, right? So really, just banning single-use plastics, I think, is the, the the way to go, and exploring alternatives, especially uh, with uh, compostables, um, and just creating a circular economy around it. You know, make it good for people to get money. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, the sign the design issue is crucial. I mean. We have to think about uh, how we're gonna, as, as, and also when we're talking about, uh, uh, for example, uh, solar panels. Puerto Rico is, is doing a big push for solar. Um, but we're starting, fortunately, we're starting, to, we're starting to talk about what we're gonna do with the solar panels as they you know, uh, get out of, get, go out of commission, right? Uh, modular panels is something that was started uh, being studied in the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, so they're easier to recycle or, the, or, or that they're easier to put apart and change maybe pieces of it instead of just throwing the whole thing away. Uh, but we really haven't reached like a, 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 an ideal model for, for that. But the yeah, modular is, is also uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, we'll take that question. Uh, yeah, uh, but mine is for Corby, so maybe you can also answer the other one. Uh, my name is Steph, uh, and I work for EarthOS. Um, so my question is around the, the vulnerability assessment. Is this something that you envisage that Corby will continue to do, like uh, actually in these places, or is it is there an element to which you can empower communities to also undertake these assessments themselves and thereby sort of expand the scope of it? And maybe adding on to that, to what extent do you think that it can also cover different kinds of, of hazards uh, in addition to the ones you focused on? Thanks for the question. Um, I will just speak briefly to the plastic question before I get to yours. Um, I do think that one thing that also needs to be part of this conversation addressing plastic is the often very unsexy work that ha needs to happen at the local and the national level. So for example, uh, in the city of Chattagram in Bangladesh, they have so much plastic pollution that it is choking the, the drainage canals in the city. It makes flooding worse. Floodwaters end up sitting in the city for weeks on end. Has a number of impacts, as you can imagine. Um, and what because the population is growing so quickly in the city, it is outstripping their waste management systems. So what that means is they need to just build more waste management facilities, improve their waste collection systems, things like that, that often are unsexy, boring, but Im critically important work that needs to get done. And similarly, that's at the local level and at the international level, in order to get to things like banning single-use <coughs> plastics, it will take engagement in things like the, the International Plastics Treaty that the next round of negotiations is later this month in Ottawa, and that kind of often very boring, very tedious work of international negotiations is, I think, going to be a critical avenue towards addressing single-use plastic and, and the impacts that it presents at a, at a global scale. Um, to speak to your questions, uh, yes, so, so, so far, um, 
we haven't gone back to sort of do updates to the assessments in any of our locations, um, but we are sort of exploring that. In part, we haven't because it's still a fairly new project, um, but we are exploring whether that would involve us going back or, yeah, whether we can engage, uh, empower the communities to do it themselves. So the, com the local communities are really at the center of our entire process. So they're doing the ones they're the ones doing the research on the ground um, to fill in those data gaps that I was talking about. Um, we haven't, we've had a few sort of experiments with trying to train other um, organizations to carry out the kind of assessments that we do. Um, they're very technically complicated, so we've had somewhat mixed results on that, but it is definitely an avenue that we're still pursuing, and, and some communities are very much interested um, in, in being equipped with the skills to sort of update that or, or, or take it on again. Um, in terms of like new and different hazards, uh, you know, I think as I sort of touched on briefly in my presentation, we're always looking to expand Corv if that becomes relevant. Um, so if we obviously incorporated a, a, a more robust incorporation of public health hazards uh, into our framework uh, last year, this year, end of last year, beginning of this year. Um, so that is one way in which we do address new hazards. Um, but Corv already, I think looks at a very wide range of hazards. Um, it wasn't sort of clear from just the, the categories or the risk areas, but within that there is a very wide range of hazards that we do look at. Um, but absolutely, I think if that became relevant, it is something that we would be very much open to. Well, thank you for uh, uh, joining me in thanking our uh, pa panelists and our moderator. So. This was a, a very enlightening uh, discussion. Um, so the schedule, we've got a little bit of a change here, not with the schedule. So this session is done. With the exhibits, we invite you to go uh, visit the exhibits. We've got the student poster contest and with the ability for people to judge those. Um, and we were supposed to come back here for our luncheon keynote with Sharon McPherson. We're actually going to, because we can't bring food into here, so we're actually going to move everything into where the exhibits are, and we're going to set that up to where we'll give the speech there um, that uh, Ms. McPherson will give her presentation there uh, while we'll have our lunch at the same time. So we'll set that up. Um, and uh, Kathy, did you want to add something, please? Yeah, I just yeah, I just wanted to say that the student poster competition we have, at each of the breaks, we have students who are prepared, like uh, one group of them, so there's four, four, and three, are going to give a brief presentation to the judges, and we invite you to listen to them. So this the first one is from 11.30 till 12. Um, I could still use... One or two more judges. We've, I've recruited some, but I could use one or two more judges if you want to, um, if you uh, uh, want to judge student posters. And, but, but I encourage you to listen, because we have some really interesting posters there, and the students are going to give a presentation on, what, on the research that they've done. And the prizes will be awarded at the reception tonight. So the schedule is, uh, we'll go back over here um, for the exhibits, the poster contest. We've got lunch. Lunches, box lunches are set up here. Um, and then we're supposed to start around noon uh, with uh, Ms. McPherson's uh, presentation. We'll probably start maybe five minutes, uh, uh, 12.05 or so into that. Uh, we'll have the luncheon in there and then uh, from 12 to 1. And then at the 1 o'clock hour, uh, we'll come back here for the next panel discussion. And so. I would note that in the, in the room there, there's a set, there, there are tables and there are also high top rounds, so there should be plenty of room for people to eat their lunches while the, while the talk is going on. Let's convene for food. Thank you.